This all started out as a story about one house, one beautiful mid-century 6,000 square foot custom built house on about two and a quarter acres in one of the most desirable neighborhoods in our city. We first heard about the house at 323 Burnham Road when we saw the headline, Developer to Raise 60's Work of Art. That's also when we met the owner, Del Holstein, the architect, Dan McMillan, and the home on Burnhamwood Estate. Del Kistler Holstein is a charming woman who has led an exciting and full life, complete with children, world travels, and an amazing affinity for the arts. In the late 50s, she and her husband, Charles Kistler, worked with architect Dan McMillan to design an incredible one-of-a-kind house befitting the large lot with mature trees on Burnham Road. They chose the right man to design their home. Dan McMillan is a gifted architect who would later be recognized as one of the most important architects of this region during the past 50 years. The Kisslers encouraged Dan to spare no expense in creating a house that was top of the line, and he did just that. When Dale and Charlie came at the first conference, my brother Frank, who was a lot more direct about such things, asked Charlie, said, Charlie, how much were you expecting to spend on this house? And Charlie said, well, I'd like to get by for $100,000. And Frank said, we've never done a $100,000 house. We'll do you five $20,000 houses. <laughs> All of my generation were influenced by Wright the, the California school, which was the kind of school of the 50s and 60s that, uh, that was in all the magazines and so on, and this house pretty much reflects that. It uh, wide overhangs and, and all that. We were big on bringing the outdoors in and all that kind of thing. And uh, Wright was all, in his organic architecture, he was all for using earth materials and, and so on. And, we had uh, the brick, which is a St. Joe brick. We just fell in love with that, with the brick, with those. It had these titanium or some kind of spots in it, and it, the colors of pinks in there, you could almost feel like you could bite a hunk out of them. It was so beautiful. And so we built that around, built the house around that and around cypress board and battens, which was a standard product as far as Macmillan and Macmillan Architects was concerned. It was important to use the same materials inside and out, so we brought the brick in, we brought the cypress in. We were the benefactor of the, of the landscape that had been built around that house. Uh, there was a huge river birch uh, right, at the, in the, uh, right off the living room, and that we built the whole house around that, and it was really important to uh, preserve the, the trees and the, and the landscape here. And, and there were a lot of old trees out there, magnolias, deodoras, cedars, and things. And uh, the architect designed the house around the views, the vistas of the trees. And I, I really felt like this, this house was my dream that had come true, that I really couldn't get over that I had so much. The Kistler Holstein House was, just as the newspaper article said, a work of art. Each room was the perfect embodiment of thoughtful design, balancing the requirements for the space with the views from the windows, the topography, how the sun comes through the windows, and the landscaping. 323 Burnham was a private retreat that complemented and respected the land. Each element was chosen with care, handmade brick from Mississippi, cypress board and batten exterior, tongue and groove walnut flooring, terrazzo floors, built-in specials everywhere, lots of windows and wide open spaces, fish ponds, and always care taken so that every window framed graceful views of trees and green spaces, artwork, and restful places. And not a neighbor in sight, it was indeed a work of art. No, it's just, just been a wonderful place to live, a wonderful house, everything about it, and the architects did a fantastic job. Dell loved her home and lived in it for more than 40 years, but after her husband died and her kids left home, 
she was ready to downsize. She wanted to find someone else who would love her home. So Dell set about putting her home on the market for a fair value. She knew it wouldn't sell fast. Homes at that price point don't just fly off the shelf, and mid-century modern homes are not for everyone. But she knew the right person would come along. So she waited. She waited a year. A few people looked at the house, but no one was ready to buy it. She adjusted the price. The second year passed. No real offers came in. Again, she adjusted the price. More years passed. What if no one wanted her beautiful home, her Burnham Wood estate? Finally, a buyer came forward, but it wasn't quite what she had expected. I'm almost 80 years old. I'm too old to have to cope with a big garden and everything it takes to look after everything. I was just tired of it. I didn't want, to, and that's the reason I put it up for sale. It was with a real estate company, and uh, lots of people look. But, you know, they wanted this other kind of house. Uh, they, there were two or three that really adored it, but they couldn't afford it. I was so, you know, aware of, this, of, her, of her whole situation. I mean, she'd been trying for five years to sell the house, and she'd certainly made an, an effort, and it became more and more of a burden all the time. Buzz Lloyd, a developer, wanted to buy Dell's house, but more importantly, he wanted to buy the two and a quarter acres on which it sat. His plan was to tear down the house and build five new houses, each with 3,500 square feet, that he would sell for around a million dollars apiece. Well, he didn't tell me that he was tearing it down, but then eventually he did, not at first he didn't, after I accepted his offer. As it started off, we were selling the house. That took some getting used to. I couldn't think of anybody else being in the house, but I finally became accustomed to that. But the, the, uh, I had thought that, that and hoped that somebody who would appreciate the house would move into it. Uh, it was kind of a shock to find out that, that Buzz Lloyd had it, uh, because I knew immediately what he intended to do with it. Well, I mean, uh, I, I, I'm just, well, how do I feel? I just wish you wouldn't tear it down. And it's odd, the house I was born in is still there, and the house my mom was born in is still there in Fuquay. <laughs> Mine's been torn down. But that's life, you never know how things will be. That's when the newspaper heard about the sale and ran the story. They interviewed Buzz for the article. He said the house was beyond saving. It was old and not very energy efficient. Uh, it was not energy efficient. Uh, it was an absolutely ridiculous, bizarre thing for anybody to say. It, uh, I mean, the house is dilapidated. It doesn't look too dilapidated to me. <laughs> no, I. I felt that that was some kind of defense that he was putting up. I'm sure he must have some reservations about his actions on this. What a shame, what a crying shame that something like that is going to be torn down just so a whole bunch of typical large boxes can be, can be shoved onto the same lot. Um, it's, it's all about making a, making a big buck on, on real estate here in Fayetteville right now instead of creating something that's compatible with the site, compatible with, with the neighborhood. I think the community should be outraged. Uh, it, these, these are treasures. These are one-of-a-kind houses. These, these are not houses that were put together by somebody just dropping little prefab post-war units all over Fayetteville. These were, these were designed by very successful, award-winning architects. They were, they were put together by by real craftsmen, by people who really understood carpentry and, and all of the, the work that goes into creating a beautiful house, and, and they're irreplaceable. About that time, Preservation North Carolina heard about the house and wondered if there was anything they could do to save this architectural treasure. Preservation North Carolina is involved in trying to save endangered properties, and some of the properties we've worked with have, more recently have been from the, the 1950s even into the 1960s where 
they're really significant properties, uh, significant architecturally. They have associations with important North Carolina architects, and in some cases, associations with national architects. The problem is they're seeing valuable land. There are a lot of tools, a lot of tools, ranging from tax credits, tax deductions, zoning uh, incentives. There are all sorts of ways you can make this work. It takes time. It takes some knowledge on the part of the owner and or friends of the owner to say, you know, sit tight, there's a way to make this work. Um, and that's the sad thing that in some cases, properties don't just simply get put on the market and the next thing you know, they're gone. We could have very successfully marketed that property for what she was asking to someone with the protective covenants in place. I don't think that that is something that would have detracted from the value or that would have made it harder to sell. The house showed in the grounds and in the structure itself that it had been you know, continually maintained. The wide overhangs and the, and the quality of material made it naturally durable. It is as uh, relevant now as it was when it was built uh, in 1960 and as elegant now. The houses that are on the National Register, which I think Dells would have easily qualified for, is then eligible for tax credits for restoration work. And in North Carolina right now, that's a 30% tax credit. I asked her to make sure that it was a done deal. She called me back and said that if he follows through, um, you know, with, with, with what they had signed, that it was a done deal. It sounded like his, his initial approach with her was that he would do everything he could to save the house. A lot of times, People hear what they want to hear, and, and I think that her interpretation was that her house was going to be okay. We didn't know it then, but Dell's house would become a flashpoint and perhaps a turning point for the issues of teardowns, infill, and historic preservation. These were passionate issues that had the power to either shape our city or destroy it from within. Well, good morning and welcome back. This is Lindsay Lab, and you're listening to the Fame of Newsmaker Hour this morning. Uh, we have Wayne Riggins and John Malzone in here with us. We're talking about the infill ordinance. I I've got no problem. I mean, realistically, the Holstein project, I think, is going to be uh, a plus. Uh, I, that might not be a popular stance, but uh, I'm, I'm fully aware that the economic feasibility of retrofitting that house. I mean, I had a client who looked at it and opted to buy another house that was more expensive but was in much better condition because they just didn't want to go ahead and have to retrofit a big beautiful old house. Now, unless we have the people in the wings to come in and do historic restorations on significant houses, then we have to understand that big houses on big tracts of land are going to fall to the wrecking ball occasionally. Now, I understand, John, your economic uh, analysis of the Holstein House, but let me give you another analysis of that Holstein House, which we miss too often in Fayetteville. It was designed by Dan McMillan, mm -hmm. one of the most important architects of the last half century in Fayetteville, no question. It was built of materials you can't get now, by craftsmen you can't hire now, in an area that was pristine at the time that it was built. If you took that house and put it in Phoenix, or you put it in Raleigh, or you put it in Cary, or you put it somewhere else... You'd get four it, times the amount. Because now, 50s, 60s, mid-century, 20th century houses are hip, retro, cool, and there's a professional urban class that buys those houses. And, and I mean, it's, it is not only the builders and developers, it's also the property owners, too. I mean, they're, they're, you know, no builder or developer can sell a piece of property unless, the, unless there's a willing seller. We know that, and, and I'm fully aware of that. And, and Steve, we get back to that highest and best use of property. As the debate continued to rage, we realized that these issues weren't affecting just our community or even just our state. This was a hot topic all across the country. In Delray Beach, for example, the headline was Communities March Against McMansions. The Dallas Morning News reported that bigger isn't better for some residents. And in Austin, a McMansion moratorium was passed by the city council. 